We have some really exciting guests coming up, but our first guest is here with us today and ready to talk about his journey into founding a talent accelerator and consultancy for Gen Z. So Ryan, thank you so much for meeting with me and to talk about your journey for everyone who is watching this. Um, how are you doing? How have you been? Yeah, it's just been busy with work, I guess, trying to continue to move House Hack forward. We we run events every two weeks, so keeping those running and yeah, trying to, to keep our clients happy, keep everything moving in the right direction as, as we grow, which I'm sure we'll get into. That sounds amazing and extremely busy. Um, so thank you for taking the time to come here and talk to us about this. Um, could you explain a bit more about your background and what house hack is and what you do yeah for sure so i guess this is the spiel right this is something that i often get asked and so what i say is i'm 22 i just graduated loughborough university in the business school over there last year so i went through that whole covid exams online experience which was fantastic in its own way and then it kind of coincided with co-founding house hack because that the very first seed, I guess, from that was April last year. So just before graduating in June of last year. And what we wanted to do is think about how we can take hackathons and make them more practical because my co-founder and I had spent a long time doing hackathons and not really seeing the output, not really seeing the impact. And so we just started running events, but actually applying our own methodology to real businesses on the other side. And what started off with just our friends, then really molded and, and, and kind of grew into a bit of a community and, and a movement, if you like, to engage Gen Z to try and have actual impact on businesses. And through doing that, actually gain experience in, in the industries that they want to work in, um, but also to get the skills that they need for the future whether that's the, the soft skills like um, networking or, or public speaking or actually taking an idea from a blue sky kind of idea to practical actions. So that's transferable skills across, across anywhere that everyone needs. And we really want to provide a space to, to get people there. But then in terms of me, I suppose. So, yeah, I mentioned 22. I'm from Essex in the UK. And, um, yeah, I think my, my passion has really been always about doing things in service of other people and so i say that i have this mission of creating a more equitable world through service and i think there's there's two key parts to that there's creating more equitable world in the sense of creating something that's got greater fairness greater equality and through service in the sense of i've always put my mind to things rather than my hands per se i've never been a kind of construction or, or kind of coder anything like that it's always been knowledge and I think transferring knowledge in the right way is, is what's going to be the kind of next generation of, of, of importance in the workplace so that's that's the kind of summary of me I suppose. During your journey to get to the position you're in now and the amazing things you're doing have you had to overcome any sort of barriers to get to where you are? In terms of barriers in, in my journey I think I probably split it in a, in a few ways so I think back to the school and then I think of, of sick form straight after that. And then I think of university as the kind of classic way that we frame our, our, our journeys as individuals through through education. So starting off at the beginning, I think school was something that I really found my feet in because I was always at school close to where I live. And I think that really helped me to find friends, first of all, to, to make friends quickly because we were always in the same cohort. And then as I moved up from, from primary school or junior school to secondary school, it was a big transition for me. And I always remember the first few days of that year seven experience being really daunting. And then kind of thereafter, the, the, the kind of challenges, I suppose, or the barriers that we might think would always be about trying to do too much. That was always the theme for me. And that translates across doing sport, doing extracurriculars, trying to do well in the classroom, um, trying to have a social life. You know, it's balancing a lot of things at the same time. And I think school was was one of the very first places that as you grow up, you kind of experience that, right? You, you manage different projects, you manage different school projects um, and the kind of extracurricular thing 
was always something I wanted to, to do. Um, and that was fantastic, but it was also almost detrimental. And I still kind of carry those habits to today where I'm trying to do too much and um, kind of take a lot on, I suppose. So that's something that I am aware of that I guess kind of, yeah, starts from, from those school days. But then moving from from sixth form, I think I think the key barrier within within sixth form was time management, which is always the classic. Um, but I studied the international baccalaureate, and um, anyone who is aware of the IB compared to A levels or just generally, um, at least when I, when I was there, 2015, 2016, the IB was a very very rigorous <laughs> qualification, and. I think that was the first time that I was exposed to that kind of higher level of, of study. And the biggest thing was not just managing the work, but managing myself as well. So time management, priority management, managing five different assignments, a massive extended essay, which was like 5,000 words or something. It was the first big research project that I was ever involved with. And so, yeah, but when I think back to sick form, I think of the IB, I think of those those challenges of, of time management and self-management that come along with that as well. But then university kicks in and I really think back to personal challenges. So I think in sick form was mainly self-management, but, but on a time management or priority level, the challenges for me at university were, 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 were very personal. So we had a, a family illness come up in, in my early days of university with my mom unfortunately getting breast cancer at the time and that was a real challenge for, for me to manage because it was something that I'd never been through before and so that then continued into not just self-management of like okay how do I approach my work but how do I approach my relationship to myself to my family and yeah that's something that continues to, to sit with me she's still ill to this day but it's something that is kind of the new normal for us if, if you like so um it's something that within covid everyone's talking about the new normal there is something that i feel i feel like i've had for for a few years now so that's how i'd kind of frame the barriers across different levels of of my journey i guess thank you so much for sharing such a personal story um i'm so sorry about your mum as well i kind of want to just take it back as well if we can um so you mentioned you tend to take on a lot of work and you used to as well and you're you st it's still kind of an issue and as a founder of my myself i do understand that a lot um it can be quite difficult so what would you suggest to students or young people who are in that sort of situation where they tend to take on a bit too much or they don't quite manage their time as well as they could um what sort of coping mechanisms do you have to share so on, on that point of of overworking within COVID, I think that always reminds me of something that I think I first came across in a book called The Four Hour Work Week from Tim Ferriss, which in the business world is, is very commonly a cited book. And he didn't create this, but he talks a lot about Parkinson's law, which is the idea, and you know, go out and Google it, research for yourself. But basically it's the idea that time will be filled and you will fill it no matter what. And so if you give yourself a certain deadline, a certain time frame to complete a task or a project, essentially you will make it fill that time. And so I've tried to kind of self-hack through different self-awareness, kind of, as you mentioned, kind of coping mechanisms to, to apply methodologies like that to myself, to think, well, if I need a deadline of two weeks time, or maybe I'll set myself a soft deadline of one week time and really hold myself to that. And then actually I've got myself a week to play with in there too. So the the key that I would kind of pass on in terms of that advice is to know yourself and know how you work, and know how you learn and, and try things out. You know, if you don't necessarily know whether you're more of a, an audio or a visual learner, try different ways of, of learning, of revising, of trying to retain the information that you need to, to for your exams, but then I would also say continue on your own pathway when you're working with others. And so that's based on my own experience of continually trying to do things by myself. When actually I know that through, through the different experiences at university and group work, that actually I do respond quite well 
to being in a group because it keeps me accountable to the deadlines, to my, my contributions, if it's a particular group project. But even just studying in silence with somebody next to me who I know is doing similar work, obviously within, within COVID, just jumping on a Zoom call and studying at the same time, those kind of things can be really useful and, and have been useful for me in, in the past. Um, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, how do you feel founding house hack has benefited you and then also the same is for how has it kind of what negative things have come up as well mm -hmm. yeah it's a great question so how has house hack benefited me i think as a as a person as a as a young founder now it's definitely allowed me to view myself and the way that i relate to others differently and, and, and i'll frame that in the context of selling something so my experiences prior to, to house hack in terms of communication were quite clear because I was always at school making presentations and things like this. But it was quite rare that I'd been in a situation where I was selling something. I might have been down a, a charity uh, jumble sale or something of that nature and I'd have to try and sell this, 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 uh, this item to, to punters. But I hadn't had a job where I had to sell something before. And I think it's really important, excuse me, when you found your own business to always understand the financial side of it too. And the business model and being a business graduate, that was kind of coming, coming naturally to a point. But within that, as we moved house out from a lockdown project to a business, we then had to ask ourselves, okay, how do we commercially make this work? And so the attitude then shifted from not can this be done but how do I do it because there's no one else no one else is coming this is this train is moving I have to work out how to to communicate yes but to sell also and so then it becomes okay where's my current skills kind of thinking about almost a skills audit of myself and what experiences I have before and then think about how can I apply that to house hack so house hack's a digital first business everything I mean everything is within covid too but even as we start to open up, things will stay digitally uh, kind of focused and digital first. And so within that, I have to work out how to sell and change my communication styles, change the way that I relate to other people a little bit. But also crucially doing that just over the computer screen and just over the camera. So when I, when I think of how it's positively impacted me, I think it's allowed me to look at my skill set, look at how I can communicate in a bit of a different way and trying to think about the outcomes that we want to achieve, which I don't think is something that you might get in a graduate role quite as quickly. I think those kind of jobs, you definitely do get the experience and the, the skills audit and the personal development. But I think certainly the speed at which we've had to move with house hack has really accelerated those kind of things, at least on, on my level. But the other side of your question, thinking about the negative moments that there's definitely been a lot and I think it's something important as a founder to try and be transparent about and, and shine a light on both privately and, and publicly because there is this kind of grandiosity I think about being an entrepreneur and being a founder um, and running a business and raising money eventually when when, when you get there and um, within that I think comes a lot of psychological challenge and a lot of mental difficulty that founders don't talk about as much as they perhaps should, because I think it's seen as as weakness or it's seen maybe as as um, by sharing some of those challenges that their business isn't as successful when that's not true. And so what I'm trying to do throughout my journey as I'm learning, as I'm documenting what I'm doing on my, my socials or um, on my website really is to, to kind of do as much as I can to be that vulnerable founder, to be that person that I want to see in others, I suppose, as well, who are further ahead in their journeys than I am. And yeah, so I think that the kind of challenges within that might be financial challenges. It might be struggles to, to pay the bills each month. It might be personal challenges of being rejected from a, a sales pitch or um, not being able to, to do the thing or learn the software as quickly enough, which has meant the consequences have followed on from that. So 
hopefully there's a few different experiences there that kind of shine a light on on some of the negative sides as well because it's definitely not um all of the kind of money cars and planes that um a lot of social entrepreneurs kind of show um despite the kind of um yeah the kind of social around around that and that's nothing against forex traders that's just my my point of view <laughs> you're a co-founder how did you find the whole process of not only founding something but also having to kind of coordinate with someone else to create this whole idea yeah it's a really interesting one actually because a lot of people a lot of kind of mentor figures a lot of teachers will also say the importance of collaboration and the importance of teamwork and the importance of accountability and a lot of that points towards having a co-founder which I definitely agree with, but only up to a, to a point, I think. And the reason for that, or, or, or the way that I'd frame that, is to say that you only need a co-founder if you need one. And you have to acknowledge the differences between being a solopreneur and then having a co-founder or multiple co-founders within a business. So one of them is the personal management side of things. If you're a solopreneur, you need to be doubly as disciplined because there's no one on the other side of the phone unless you force yourself into that kind of accountability. As a co-founder, you then have shared responsibility. That means shared liability. That means shared risk. That means shared challenges. And so everything is, at least in our position, down the middle. And within that kind of relationship, it's super important to have a strong relationship with your co-founder. And so then it becomes a question, how do you find your co-founder? And this is where I disagree with a lot of kind of common thinking that I see out there. And that's that you can find co-founders anywhere. You can kind of make co-founders um, and, and you can kind of mold your own relationships to become co-founders. And I think my, my advice on, on that is to make it happen organically or allow it to happen organically in the sense that if you force yourself into a co-founder relationship too early, or with the wrong person, it's doubly as difficult to undo that or to get out of it or to, or to, or to track back because I, I can't count the number of friends or colleagues or people that I've connected with who have been a co-founder and then they've connected with somebody through university or through a mutual friend even and then the other person has left the business or they've not pulled their weight and so they've had to sell half the business back to the other person. And, it, it can be it can be a bit messy and so my advice when thinking about starting your own projects is start them without a co-founder first or if you're starting them with someone don't formalize it as a business too early or don't formalize it with roles and titles as co-founders just yet make sure you're committed to the longevity of the project um, or the business and appreciate that you can add a lot of value you can start running a business without registering without taking on too many costs and things like this because I think that's part of the challenge um, within that, that kind of story that I gave a lot of people start formalizing too early and then they want to track back from that which is quite quite difficult and quite um, costly at times too so yeah there's some some thoughts there um kind of an interesting one um if you weren't doing what you're doing right now what do you think you would be doing Mm, yeah, I think I'd be on the graduate scheme or, or role kind of trail um, within what industry, I don't know, probably strategy consulting or something of that nature. Um, potentially, if not that, though, I would be in a startup, maybe um, a social accelerator that works with socially focused businesses or something like that. Um, or potentially just unemployed at home, like a hell of a lot of people as well. I mean, I'm still at home and whether a business counts as a job yet or not, we'll see. But um, yeah, I think the, the interesting one is how COVID is impacting Gen Z. You know, I'm at the very, very top end of that age range of 22, I was born in 1998, but I do count myself within that. And just the impact that COVID has had and is going to have, I don't think we've even fully begun to realize it yet because so much of it is five, 10 years in the future for us still at the eye of the storm 
still huge collective trauma and challenges, economic challenges on top of that. And I think the interesting thing is when I when I reflect back to even nine, ten months ago starting House Hack was that it, it was something that happened organically, but then when it became to June when it came to June and graduating, I had two choices, but also no choice at all, because I could have gone down the route of trying to, to find work to get a job. And I did that for a while. And, and it, it's a job in itself, getting a job. It really is spending the time to write your CVs, your cover letters, to find the right people online, perhaps on LinkedIn, for example, to then send those emails, to then go to the interviews as and when you get them, to prepare for those interviews. It's a job in itself. And so I still felt like I was managing two jobs with House Hack and applying for grad things. And so it came to the point where a choice had to be made, but then also I was always, I think, going to go in that self-employed direction eventually. And so it became the only choice in a way, because I think COVID forced me in that direction, not just to start House Hack in the beginning, because we were in lockdown at that time, but as we started to open up and as I then graduated to then actually dive in full time and force myself to, to make it happen as it were. So yeah, it's something that I can't really imagine that alternate future, I think, yeah. One more question before we wrap it up. Um, what are your goals moving forward with house hack do you have any kind of vision ahead in maybe the next six to 12 months anything exciting coming up yeah so i mentioned at the beginning i i think about how we're running our innovation challenges our, our, our main event every two weeks so that is an opportunity for students young people to come along get experience working with a real business so we're running those every two weeks and on the flip side, we're running a lot of our talent challenges as well. We're trying to queue those up. So those are, are how we fund the rest of our business model. So innovation challenges are free. And then it's just going out and contacting the type of client that we want to work with. And so in terms of what's on the horizon for us, it's really that next phase of growth. I think from when we started to maybe January, end of, end of January, February, early February, really going through that first phase of figuring out what we are, who we are, where we're going. We got set up as a business over the summer too. And now we're in that safer position to then have that kind of narrower focus, if you like, to go in the same direction for a sustained period of time and up the intensity a little bit too. So yeah, in terms of where, where we're going, hopefully more events, more impact on, on young people and graduates and, uh, yeah, really excited for, for what's to come. Um, so that was the last question. So I just want to say a massive thank you to you for coming on here and talking about your experience. Um, I'm sure this is going to help quite a lot of people. Um, so if anyone's interested in contacting you or seeing your other work or seeing anything to do with House Hack, where would they find you? Good question. Probably the best bet is LinkedIn ryan mcgee on there or my website is www.rymcgee.com so you can find me there as well thanks so much for, for having me on Hannah. i really appreciate the opportunity and hopefully there's there's some some thoughts and value there for everyone and set, setting up the project and at the, at the listeners on the other side Thank you so much for watching this video and for supporting the young founders that have been interviewed throughout the series for the One Third Project YouTube channel. To find out more information about the One Third Project and what we do on any projects you may want to get involved in, you can head over to www.onethirdproject.co.uk.